we'll be talking about Cape Town. But as South Africa is one of the most beautiful countries anywhere with one of the best road systems, we'll also focus on traveling by car, the best way to experience the Rainbow Nation. With a good vehicle, a great playlist, and stimulating company, a South African excursion makes for a wonderful vacation. Our guest is Andre Von Ketz, director at Drive South Africa Car Rental Company. Welcome, Andre, to Places I Remember. Thank you so much for having me, Leah. It's lovely to chat to you today. Andre has rounded up some of his favorite South African routes, beginning or ending in Cape Town. And before we talk about that great city, can you tell me why is South Africa especially suited for a driving trip? Yeah, South Africa has, as you mentioned, a fantastic road network, really good quality highways connecting the major, major hubs. You can fly into Cape Town in the south or Johannesburg in the north. You can get between the main hubs relatively easily. And geographically, actually, is the gem of South Africa. We're at the tip of a continent, two oceans either side. On our east coast, we've got these gigantic mountains, Zatara. And in the west, it's kind of a semi-desert area neighboring on Namibia. So it's the diversity of our terrain, if I were to sum it up in a sentence, that makes our country quite special. I remember visiting there. I thought you have everything. Absolutely beautiful <laughs> country. Well, what sort of vehicle do you recommend if you're going to take a road trip in South Africa? It really depends where you're going. But for the most part, you can get around in a regular sedan or SUV if you need a little bit of extra luggage room or space to move with your traveling companions or family. And then there are a handful of national parks you go to or can go to that require four by four, you know, all terrain vehicles. Even those parks where you get to go off road and get to go a little bit rougher and tougher do have gravel and tar roads that you can see the wildlife. You can experience the majority of that park's wonders still on the regular roads in a regular car. In fact, there's, there's plenty of people that have been out there on those little VW Beetle bugs and they go north to south, Cape to Cairo. But of course, you know, we're talking about South Africa today. So yeah, depends on where you want to go. Right. You do drive on the left side of the road, I would say. So people from the United States might want to note that. But you can get used to that. Road signs are all in English. English is the language spoken universally. There are many other tongues. In fact, South Africa, I think, has 11 official languages. But sort of the common denominator is English. So, yeah, I don't think there's ever much of a problem of getting lost, especially in today's you know, technical world with Google Maps and whatnot. So, exactly. so those fears can be allayed uh, quite easily. What about food and accommodation along the way? Of course, you can expect hotels, the big Marriott's, the uh, Hilton, the brands that you're familiar with in the city centers. Airbnb has grown tremendously in the last five to 10 years here. So there's plenty of Airbnbs to find along the way. And then once you get into the parks, really the gems of South Africa's sort of national heritage, we've got a accommodation offering that's very similar to the U.S. national park system. I've traveled in Yellowstone and a few other parks in the U.S. So it was quite nice to compare the similarities and differences. In fact, driving through Yellowstone, if anyone can relate to that, where you've got the bison right next to your vehicle, if you go walking at the right time of year, you see the bears. We have very similar experiences here, very similar accommodation types from, you know, modest huts and camping where you can pitch a tent in certain areas through to the lodges with dining, three meals a day, all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's relatable for people who have traveled and road tripped in the USA. Do you suggest pre-booking? I would think so during busy periods for sure, but in general, if you can. Yes, if you can spot where the South African school holidays are, then you must pre-book in the national parks. As soon as you're outside of those school holidays, availability opens up. Of course, last minute you may struggle here and there, but whether you can self-search, the, the, the national parks themselves has got a great booking system on their website. Uh, find a reliable operator that can help you plan and guide you on your trip, point you in the right direction. These are the things we advise all of our guests that travel with us. Okay. So we put together a few of the most special drives in South Africa, beginning or ending in Cape Town. But let's start with a brief discussion of what not to miss in that great city, as you'll likely spend some time there before or after the road trip. I'll just mention a few of the obvious, wonderful, there are so many wonderful things in, in Cape Town, but let's start with Table Mountain. It's known for its flat top, which resembles a tabletop. Do you know why it be, it's flat like that? I hope I don't butcher the history of this, but <laughs> it's a mountain which actually grew out, I think, three times the size it is today. Over time, it actually has eroded down and there's a granite layer or, or a harder sedimentary layer that resisted some of that erosion and created that flat top. And then, of course, all the rain and the wind and the weather that happens here at the Cape of Storms 
has weathered the ravines and the beautiful forests and the streams that run off Table Mountain that I, as a trail runner, explore, I don't know, once, twice a week. Lucky so you. It's, it, it's an absolute treasure for anyone living here or visiting that loves the outdoors. Yeah. Well, you can take an aerial tram to the top, which I did. It's misty mm-hmm. in certain parts. It's very, very beautifully misty. And you see everything, the whole vista. It's a very good way to start, I think, to see the overview of Cape Town from Table Mountain. So that would be one thing I would recommend. How about Kirsten Bosch Garden, which is at the foot of Table Mountain? Tell me about that. Yes, another one of our favorites. And as a as a family, I've got two young girls. We are constantly in Kirsten Bosch doing small hikes, climbing the trees there, going on the nature trails. And beyond a, a beautiful, secluded, well-maintained park, it's actually a real hub of bi- natural biodiversity. The Biodiversity Institute is right there. The National Biodiversity Institute is there, and you can learn a lot about our biome, which has got hundreds of species that are found nowhere else in the world. Yes, I think it has five of South Africa's six different biomes right there. So you get a good overview of of the country. How about Robben Island? Yes, it's obviously a iconic location, what it represented to South Africa in many years gone by. And what it represents to us now is still a big part of South African society. It's imperative that we remember and honor and understand our past so that we can, you know, make sure things are A, not misrepresented and B, um, we don't, you know, we learn from our mistakes as a society and uh, Robin Island provides an insight to that, but it's something to be experienced, not yes. just seen uh, or, or read about. This is where Nelson Mandela was imprisoned. You take a tour from the Victoria and Albert waterfront. It's about three and a half hours. They take you over by boat and then by bus. You see the cell where he was imprisoned, and it's very moving. Our guide had been imprisoned himself during apartheid and knew Mandela. It was memorable and it was moving, and I highly recommend taking the three-hour tour. You won't forget it. I just want to mention the waterfront there. It's a wonderful area. It's been redeveloped. It has all kinds of galleries and shops, and it also has the New Zeitz Museum of Contemporary Art Africa, which is the largest museum of contemporary art from Africa anywhere i haven't visited it can you tell me a little about it yeah it it's i think only about three or four years old it opened sort of just pre-covid constantly changing the galleries there or the exhibitions there it's actually the latest addition to this waterfront that every three or four years they're rolling out and expanding and offering new uh, interactive spaces so yeah the waterfront is quite a special special part of cape town it's kind of where everyone interacts with each other the tourists and locals alike so you know you'll find some places when you travel around the world but if you go to the the Eiffel Tower in Paris I think you're mostly going to see tourists there right not so much the Parisians the waterfront is not that you get to mix you get to blend you get to see each other and see how yeah so so that's part of the charm and of course the Zeit is just one of the many uh, jewels that that the waterfront has as far as neighborhoods I love Bocap which is a neighborhood of very narrow cobble streets lined with colorful houses. I read that the colors were attributed to the fact that the houses had to be white when the slaves were living there many years ago. So when they got their freedom, they painted in these gorgeous neon colors. So for Instagrammers, this is one of the great places in the city, and it represents freedom because it's a beautiful example of what can come out of something that wasn't so good. Yeah, 100%. And it's it's beautifully close to the city center where you, know, you could be at one of the premier restaurants and just, in fact, there are many great restaurants in the Boer Cop. It's wonderfully close and it's a wonderfully rich experience too. Some wonderful melee food, all different uh, nationalities. It's, it's a great, great area to walk in. One museum, which I, I want to mention because again, it represents the past and coming forward is District 6 Museum. It was declared in 1966 a white area only, and the community had to leave. 60,000 people were forcibly removed to an area called Cape Flats, and their houses were destroyed. So there's a museum there now representing what happened, and I think that's very important to note that there's a a way to honor this, uh, the people who had to go through this, and to think about the past. I think it's very moving to see that as well. What do you think? hundred percent. You know, I was there a couple of years ago. And even as a Captonian, sometimes you don't do all the touristy things in your own town. But of course, once I'd been there, you know, it just opened your eyes and uh, a little bit wider and displays, uh, you know, like uh, street signs that, you know, people have taken with them when they left, when they were forced to be removed. They brought back and you and you see these 
real tangible artifacts and stories display there quite quite wonderfully. Well, let's end with the Cape of Good Hope. I know that's kind of a drive. We're, we're sort of edging toward driving. It's it's so close that you could just take a, a tour from Cape Town. But tell me about the, the road that goes to the Cape of Good Hope. It's a rocky headland on the Cape Peninsula. What do you see there? Yes, it's part of the massive sprawling national park that is the Cape Peninsula. It's, I think, the peninsula itself is about 60 to 70 kilometers north to south. So if you're doing a round trip from the city center or from the waterfront where many of the hotels are, you're driving a good, without stopping, two hours to the Cape of Good Hope, uh, the Cape Point, and two hours return. But of course, you, you make a full day round trip of it. So, so you stop for lunch there. You can stop at multiple beaches. You get to visit the penguin colony on, on the uh, false bay side, Boulder's yes. Beach, exactly. And when you're at the Cape Point or into, into the Cape of Good Hope Park, you get to the, some people say it's the most southern tip of Africa, which is technically incorrect. It's the most southwesterly tip of Africa, but it is where the two great oceans meet. The Atlantic and, and the Indian. Correct. The Atlantic and Indian Ocean meet. And you can swim on one side of the bay and feel the temperatures of, I don't know what is it, Fahrenheit, but let's call it 15 degrees centigrade. You swim the other side, it could be 12 degrees centigrade. And you've just walked, I don't know, five one or two a mile or so from one side beach to the other beach and the temperatures are different because the currents are different the sea life is different it's got beautiful walking trails it can be wild and rugged and stormy but that's all the charm of it and and i think it was called the cape storms too by all the sailors uh, first navigated around africa from europe to try and make it to the east and there are literally dozens or even hundreds of wrecks along that coastline that all form part of the story. And, and even the slaves and, and the people that became part of the Cape culture, that point is a part of that, that whole story. Yeah. Wonderful thing to do when you're in Cape Town. So let's go a little further afield. Let's start on a nature drive called the garden route between Cape Town and Gibera. Tell us about when's the best time to go and what do we see? Sure. I'll tell you about best time. And the, and this sound might sound like a fence sitting answer, but because of the climate along that coast, it's in the Mediterranean band, all year round is the best time. It actually has statistically the lowest variance of temperature, rainfall, and all of those things throughout the year. So it doesn't get terribly hot in summer, and it doesn't get terribly cold in winter. So it really is a, a great all year round route. It's scattered with small villages and towns. It's beautiful green forests and ravines and rivers all the way from Cape Town to Koberga to pronounce it a little bit uh, more accurately. Thank you for very you. much. Previously, <laughs> previously known as Port Elizabeth. It might be a more familiar term to some oh, yes. people who've traveled, traveled before. And on the eastern extent, as you get past Neisner, Plettenberg Bay, which are beautiful seaside lagoon type holiday destinations, to the east of that, as you head towards Port Elizabeth, we start encountering some of the game reserves and game lodges where you can see Big Five, you can see Africa's wildlife in a natural environment. And the beauty of those parks is that it's outside of the malaria zone. So if anyone's traveling and worried about malaria and that type of thing, which is a concern in East Africa and other parts of Southern Africa, it's a really nice family-friendly route. I think last year, the year before, just as we came out of COVID, I took my family, we rented a motorhome, and we spent 10 days up and down the coast, a round trip. So you drive two or three hours, stay a night or two, drive another two or three hours, stay a night or two. And then the one-way route back from Port Elizabeth uh, or Addo National Park, where we stayed, is sort of a 10-hour a drive one way. So you break it up nicely in one direction, and then you bomb it home afterwards. And family okay. had a great time, lots of diversity, lots of exploring. That's terrific fun. for families, yes. Now, what about yeah, the wine much. lover's route? You got Route 62. It's famous. It's considered the longest wine route in the world, 850 kilometers between Cape Town and Port Elizabeth, connecting the east and west coast. There's so much to see and do besides drinking wonderful wine. I know if you want to stay close to Cape Town, I did go to some of the areas very close in, you know, Stellenbosch and some of those, which are absolutely wonderful. But you're taking us all the way through seeing much more when, when we take a drive. So let's say Parle. What would you see in Parle? That's a famous uh, wine town. Yeah, so Parle, Stellenbosch, Franschhoek are the three kind of top wine areas, all, you know, relatively close to each other. And it's almost hard to say that 
Paul is here and Stellenbosch is there, they're actually all just a family that mingle and you can move from one and, and there's no like hard line to say, now I'm in Paul, now I'm in Stellenbosch or now I'm in Francia. Paul does have some beautiful wine farms. I was actually camping in the, in the Paul Mountains this weekend with a family. Beautiful, beautiful spot with rock pools and streams. Excellent wine farms all around us. Very good food. I remember, I remember some interesting chocolate and all kinds of different uh, national, you know, specialties from different nationalities. Lovely, lovely meals as well in that area. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and some really uh, top notch chefs and restaurants that, that have popped up over the years. Well, what I like about the long wine route, which could take you a couple of weeks if you really want to do it <laughs> right. Uh, you have so many things. You have a desert oasis in, in Robertson. Tell us about that. Yeah, so Robertson, again, is another deep valley with plenty wine farms and orchards and fruits. Yeah, it's just such a fertile, beautiful part of the country. They have a, I don't know of that oasis per se, but or myself, I haven't been there, I should say. I can't really comment on it. But I know every year they've got a wonderful uh, wine festival called the Robertson Wine Festival. It's five or six days with music and wine tastings and brandy tastings and, and good food. And it's just a little bit further out of Cape Town. So, you know, you choose that destination when you've got a little bit more time on your on your calendar. Well, it's semi-arid. It isn't probably desert like you would think in the Sahara, but it has this feel to it. And it also has river rafting, which is a nice thing to do before you drink some wine. I think it would be better to drink it after. Yeah, on the Breda but... River, you, you, yeah, there's some wonderful rapids and, and, and not sort of uh, extreme rapids, but yes, river rafting yeah. is one of the many activities you can do. Very pleasant. And then you have hot springs a little further on in Montague. Again, there's so many wonderful different things besides the wine. You have uh, wonderful little towns. They're called Karoo Dorpies. Is that the name for a small town? Is that how I pronounce it? The, the area is called the Karoo, which is a semi-arid uh, area. And a Dorpi is a town for like a little village. Yeah. And, they, and the Afrikaans term for a small village. There's a place in a town called Kalitsdorp called Ronnie's Sex Shop, and it's got, it's very well known. Why is that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it kind of popped up, I don't know how many years ago. It's almost a place of legends, but, you know, it's perfectly positioned for a road trip lunchtime stop. Some people claim you must have a beer and a burger there. But um, it's not a but sex when you, shop. <laughs> but when you walk inside, it's just got, uh, I'm not going to give too much of the fun away, but it's got lots of interesting regalia and paraphernalia on the walls for for you to enjoy and chuckle at and uh, yeah i read you know, that it was just... it was a prank that the sign was put up where it was really just a pub and they put the sign up and it sort of developed after after years but it was kind of fun so i yeah. i really love that idea you also have caves in the area and mountain passes it's just a, a wonderful area to find the whole terrain of south africa again coming in from cape town is it about two weeks would keep cover the whole thing if you were taking your time or yeah, absolutely. And, and and in a one-way direction, taking the time to stop everywhere, 10 or 12 days. And it's basically, if you go the garden route, which we spoke about earlier, that follows the coast from Cape Town eastwards. Right. And if you wanted to do the return journey as slightly inland, just inland of the mountain range and through that more more arid uh, Karoo, Dorpies and so forth. So you could do 10, 12 days in one direction and 10, 12 days coming on the inland route. And you've done a beautiful loop that really exposes you to all of sort of the southern parts of our country. Sounds beautiful. Well, we have to mention the coastline road trips. We mentioned the Cape of Good Hope, but I just want to talk about Chappies, the Chappies, Chapman's Peak <laughs> Drive, which I have been on and is magnificent. And also you have the other road, Clarence Drive. These are two drives that if you want to see the magnificent mountains to the sea, this is what you would do. Nine kilometers from downtown Cape Town, I think one of them is. So uh, absolutely. So yeah, Chapman's Peak Drive connects Hout Bay and Nurok Beach, or the suburb of Nurok with a beautiful long white beach. It's oh, I don't know exactly what year it was built, but it's I think over a hundred years old now. It's carved into a near cliff face, not quite a cliff face, but near cliff face. It's westwards facing. So uh, in the evenings, driving along Chapman's Peak Drive, you have glorious sunsets. You know, the sun uh, reflecting off the ocean, uh, the Atlantic Ocean, and then lighting up these sandstone rock cliff faces that just glow orange every evening. It's magnificent. Um, and you can see whales. I, I saw whales when I was driving. You can see them out in the bay. And speaking of whales, Clarence Drive, the other one you mentioned earlier, is the road you take. It's just a little bit hugs the ocean a little bit more closely. It's not as high and sort of cliffish, but that's the road you take to get to Hermanus, about an hour and a half drive from Cape Town. 
all along that drive, uh, you do get to see whales and other sea life. And then when you get to Hermanus, it's known for being one of the world's largest breeding grounds of southern rights and other whale species. So what makes it so special is they actually come really close into the bay on these with these protruding rocks and, and, and walkways that you can walk along and look down at these mother's carving with their young. I assume you've been there and seen it. You're looking very yes. excited. And no, I, I stopped at Sparks <laughs> Bay. I remember a little coastal town called Sparks Bay where you had barbecue and you could watch the whales along that Absolutely. route as well. Yeah, it's just magical. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. For any sea and nature lover, it's, it's a wonderful place to go and, yeah. and a road to drive. Well, the name of the podcast is Places I Remember. So, Andre, would you please share one memory of one of your South African road trips? Yeah, it's kind of hard to pick one, but, you know, if forced to, I would say the trip I took with my young family, wife and two daughters, through COVID, just two, three years ago. It was after the immediate restrictions had been lifted, but we still couldn't gather in large groups and all of those kinds of things. And that's when we said, right, let's hire this motorhome. Let's all bundle into it. We'll create our own little tight family bubble, as we call it. You know, everyone spoke in those terms through that era. And we went out there. And after being kind of getting out there a lot less than we used to for six or nine months, I think it was, we actually took the kids out of school a a week early just so that we could be on the road when it was slightly less busy. We had campsites to ourselves. We went to the national parks and there was a third of the other vehicles and people you would normally expect. I don't know if this is absolutely true, but there's some people that say that During COVID, when there's fewer visitors to the national parks, the animals actually sort of came out a bit more and they were enjoying the freedom from the vehicles and the people that were there to see them. So we kind of got out there because we needed to get out. We were feeling cooped in and we got to experience South Africa again after not having done it for a while. And it was just, to me, that's a special memory. We haven't stopped pretty much since then. We just keep going. That's great. Well, thank you, Andre von Ketz, for reminding us once again that the freedom of the open road and the ability to go off the beaten track can create a unique, unforgettable journey, especially in a great country like South Africa. Thank you very much. It's an absolute pleasure. Thanks, Leah.